As we mentioned, most of this Quran is a journey of Musa alayhi salam. This is a story. The main players inside this story are Fir'aun, Qarun, and Haman. These are the three. This is Fir'aun. This attack that existed right at the beginning. What does he want to do? He wants to slay their children and kill the women. Put that in context in today's world. They come outside houses and they announce them on a megaphone. And people thinking, who are these names that they're asking for? They're names of the children that they want to take out. A child who's five years old is dragged, headlocked, persecuted. That's why you even see the small children, you see them. They're speaking like they're powerful men and women. That we're not going to give in. We're not going to move an inch of our land. Amma ba'du fa inna astaq al-hadithi kitabullah. Wa khayr al-huda huda Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam Wa sharr al-umuri muhdathatuha Wa kulla muhdathatin bid'a Wa kulla bid'atin dalalatin Wa kulla dalalatin fin nar Rabbi shrah li sadri Wa yassir li amri Wa ahlu luqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And sending immense greetings and salutations upon the final Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam Continuing a series of supplications Of calling and beseeching and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Whereby we mention that the natural need of the human being Is to be not left in a state of poverty Especially when it comes to the genealogy or the lineage Or those family members around them That we mentioned that supplication that highlight inside towards the end of Surah Al-Furqan speaking about Ibad rahman the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that amongst his supplications is bestow upon us righteous progeny, righteous children, that they become qoratu a'yunin, they become the coolness of our eyes. That is the spiritual dimension that the human being searches for. Because as we mentioned that amongst even the non-Muslims that they began to recognize that power is via the amount of children that you have and the wealth that you possess. And this is a natural phenomenon of the human being, as Allah mentioned. The beginning of Surah Al-Imran, Allah mentioned, The thing that man loves, the covetous greed to possess and to own these things, is marriage, is women. Albanin is children, wealth, gold, silver, branded horses, property, land, tilth. These are the mata'. These are the provisions of this dunya, what the human being likes, wants to possess, wants to own. Because Allah mentioned, Allah ya'lamu man khalaq, wa huwa latiful khabir. Doesn't Allah know what he's created? He knows what the human being, what it wants inside this dunya. That's what Allah mentioned, al-malu wal-banun, zinatul hayatid dunya. Wealth and property is the beautiful things of this dunya that people aspire to have. No one wants to be impoverished. No one wants to be in a state of, of poverty. No one wants to be in a state of, of asking or relying upon other people. That's why you find many Arab proverbs are mentioned about poverty. That, uh, that you find poverty al-faqar wuqud al-kufar. That poverty leads a person towards disbelief at times. Obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is destined that some people will be poor, but it can lead to kufr that a person wants to aspire to attain certain things inside their life. Or the environment around them pushes them to begin to maybe steal or to rob or to harm people, to take something thinking that I'm in a state of need, so I have every right to do this inside my life. And also the mention, لَوْ كَانَ فَقْرًا رَجُلًا لَقَتَلْتُهُ Some of the attributes to the statement, Ali bin Abi Talib, woman of Khattab. Fa'ihal is a famous statement. If fakr was to be classified as a human being in front of you, you would slay it, you would kill it. Because of the harm that poverty can cause upon the person. But people will be at times in poverty. People will be poor. As we find the masakeen, what du'afa will enter into paradise 500 years before the rich people. So is there a contradiction between these statements and this understanding? No, there isn't. Because those people have become content in their life. They have contentment. They recognize that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is destined for me. They don't go beyond the limits and the bounds to begin to do haram things or wrong things. To try to claim their share or so-called share of this dunya. And begin to break the hudud, the rights and regulations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And prior to all of this, the Prophet himself mentioned, Allahumma inni a'udhu bikam al-kufri wal-faqr. He sought refuge from kufr, disbelief and faqr, poverty. You can see the relationship that we mentioned. That poverty can lead towards kufr, towards disbelief. 
towards being ungrateful with that which Allah subhanahu wa has bestowed upon every single one of us. And in the grand scheme of things, that we, we are all in need. Wallahu huwa al-ghaniyu wa antumul fuqara. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's or they all rich. We are fuqara. We are all poor in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That even whatever we, we possess of this dunya, what we own, whatever we claim to have, it's all malullah. It's all the wealth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're just playing custodians on this dunya. That's all that we're playing. It all belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we find in this, this ayah and this discussion. is going to speak about those people who believe that wealth, power, control, might, authority belongs to them. And they make such audacious statements as, we deserve it. It belongs to us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected us to be those people in sovereign power, in govern, governing over people. And is a mantik, a logic that Quran speaks about heavily and deeply. That many of us can't seem to extract those lessons inside the Quran. The Quran is a story that plays again and again and again. That's when people think that the Quran stops. Al Quran yatakarrar, it continues stories, it continues history, it continues life. Because it doesn't stop at one prophet or one generation, one people. It continues for all time. That's we mentioned that Quran is timeless. It's a timeless journey that any moment you can read the Quran, see certain verses of the Quran, they come into play. They come into motion and you begin to see the world around us. And this is what the Quran, even today, is what it's speaking about. If only we understood the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's we find that these worldly riches and these spiritual riches. Because when we mention that the wife of Fir'aun, she wanted a, a, a worldly rich. That she wanted her own child. So she made the same statement of Quratu A'yun, Quratu Ain, that I want a coolness of my eyes. She wanted a child. So whatever we want, the riches of the dunya, the riches of the akhirah, it's all in that supplication that we make on a daily basis. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. Give us good in this world and give us good in the hereafter. A good world, a good life, good things in this dunya that we can use. To get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give us good inside al-akhirah and save us from the punishment of the hellfire is the greatest goal that we find. So in those supplications we spoke about from Surah Al-Furqan, that to show the human nature, just like we spoke about Yunus and Zakaria and all his previous prophets, some of these supplications there to show the human nature for us human beings in our lives, that look what these prophets, what they went through, and look how they turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at their wording, Look at their, their state, haluhum, their condition. You know, these are loved individuals by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A'zamul khalq, the best of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look how sometimes he takes them on such a, such a hard journey, exploits them to such a degree to bring out the best of them, the best of a mankind, best of humans. For what purpose? Li'ayi qas, li'ayi ghaya. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring the Prophet through so many hardships? So many difficulties, loves him abundantly, selected him and chose him, drove him through all these hardships to refine himself. That's what even Qaim al Josiah speaks about that when hardships come upon a people or come upon a person, it's only to clear the environment. It's to clear the environment that what comes next is going to be far greater, far greater blessings, far greater peace, far greater success. So at that moment in time, we just see these hardships. We see this bloodshed, turmoil, destruction, tribulation, fit and trials, tadbir, destruction. That's what we see all around us. But inside that, all of that, there's something that we can't imagine. We can't understand what's going to take place beyond that. And amongst those prophets, that grand scheme of things is Musa alayhi salam. As we mentioned, most of this Quran speaks about but is the journey of Musa alayhi salam, the grand scheme of things, the amount of difficulties that this prophet he went through. That's what Allah mentioned. Kama sabara ul azmi min rusul. Be patient like those grand prophets. And ulama tafasidah mentioned the grand prophets are five prophets. Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, wa Isa, wa Nabiyuna Muhammad These are the grand prophets. Ulul azmi min rusul. Read about their lives, their seerahs. Why does Allah select these five out of the 25 mentioned inside the Quran and the others that came after them or before them? Why these specific prophets read their seerahs to see what they went through, these individuals? 
That's when the hadith inside Bukhari, when Musa alayhi salam or the Prophet mentioned when he made the Isra wal Mi'raj journey, Uridat Ali al Umm, I saw the nations. And he saw this sawad and Azim, I saw this great black crowd or great clustering or gathering of people, immense crowd of people, millions of people. And he thought that that was his nation. He thought that was his people. He said, no, that's not your people. That is the people of Musa. That, that, sorry, that's not your people to, to the Prophet. That is the people Musa. Then he said, look to the opposite direction and see your nation. That your nation will be far more greater nation than the nation of Musa alayhi salam. In another hadith inside Sahih Muslim that we find in speaking about the night journey as well. Where the Prophet has made this journey going up into the heavens, meeting all different prophets, leading them in prayer in Baytul Maqdis. The hook whereby he left the Burak, we tied the Burak, still remains in Baytul Maqdis. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate it once again. It's a blessed region, blessed, blessed environment where he tied the Burak and then he was taken up into the heavens from beyond that. And when he stepped into all the different stages of the heavens, he met different prophets and he greeted them and he said, who is this young prophet amongst us, beloved prophet who came after us? When he goes past the sixth heaven, he goes past Musa alayhi salam. Goes past Musa alayhi salam or gives him salam, gives him greetings. Then Musa alayhi salam begins to weep. But and yabki. Musa begins to cry. It's, it's like Sahih Muslim Kitab al-Iman. It's like Musa is a strong character, strong individual. That why, why is Musa alayhi why is he crying? He said that this young individual has got a far greater following a nation than me. I thought I had such a great following. But look at this young prophet, the amount of people that came after him following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And as we find that this journey of Musa alayhi salam in a state of weakness, of fatigue and tiredness, it's a long journey right from the beginning, Surah Al-Baqarah. It just begins with Musa alayhi salam. It begins with Bani Israel. The journey just continues throughout the Quran of the journey of Musa alayhi salam. But specifically inside Surah Al-Qasas, in the 28th chapter of the, of the Quran, these 77 or 88 odd verses that we find in Meccan Surah, except for one verse some ulama begin to discuss. Even the Surah is called Surah Al-Qasas, the, the Surah of Stories. Even Ibn Ashur mentioned that the word Qasas is mentioned inside the Quran, previously inside Surah Yusuf, but Surah Yusuf is sent down afterwards. So that's why this Surah is given the story of being called Surah Al-Qasas. فَلَمَّا جَعْهُ وَقَصَّ عَلَيْهِ الْقَصَصَ Based upon this verse that occurs inside the Surah, that when he came to his one of you, Shu'ayb alayhi salam, when he came to the father of the two daughters and he narrated his story to them. So this is the story of Musa alayhi salam. That's why Imam Suyuti mentions that Al-Quran kullu is Musa alayhi salam. The whole of the Quran is just Musa alayhi salam. Hundreds of times Musa is mentioned inside the Quran. So as of this surah, even it's called Surah Al-Qasas, can be called Surah Musa. Because of these 88 verses, the first 50 verses, I only speak about Musa alayhi salam. Then there's a slight pause and a break. And from verse 75 or 77 onwards, all the way to the end of the surah, it returns back to the story of Musa alayhi salam. So as if the whole story, the whole surah, the story mentioned inside this surah, is nothing but Musa alayhi salam. Amongst the tawasim. Tawasim is those surahs that begin with ta, seen, meem. Only three surahs begin with ta, seen, meem inside the Quran. They run in, in accordance. Surah Al-Shu'ara, the 26th chapter, then Surah Al-Naml, then Surah Al-Qasas. It comes the conclusion of these surahs that we find. There's a sir that some of the ulama begin to discuss about this attribute of these surahs being given these titles, being given these names. As for Maqasid surah what is the intent of this surah? Because obviously we can't go through all 88 verses. But ulama plucked out the main intent of this surah that's plausible inside this discussion is to show Qudratullah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show the power and the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what ulama mentioned, ulama tafasir that min mawdu'a this surah is to show the strength and the power of Allah. How he will destroy these individuals and those who become full of pride and arrogance about themselves. Second, we find tathbeetul mu'mineen to give affirmation to the believing individuals. As the verse in Surah mentioned, al-ghalibun, you're going to be successful. Another place in the same sort of mention will aqibatu lil muttaqin. The end is going to be for the pious individuals. So this conviction inside this surah that even all these hardships, all these difficulties, there's going to be victory for the believers, 
for the Muslims that's going to take place. And likewise, Imam Baqai mentions at-tawadu lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a humble person, to be a humble individual with the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us. And also inside this surah, we find some of the, the topics that this surah begins to speak about. Is the Quran itself as it begins with. It speaks about dhikr, tughyan, fir'aun. Speaks about the oppression of Fir'aun that he carried out. Wa and the corruption he carried out upon this earth. Wa dhikr Milad Musa alayhi salam. The dhikr of the birth of Musa alayhi salam. And the story of Al-Qibti. When Musa alayhi salam went and killed this, this individual. is mentioned inside this surah. And likewise you find the strengthening of the iman of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. And at the end of the surah you find the qissa of Qarun. And his oppression that he began to carry out upon his people. The surah begins to speak about. And just to look at certain verses. Before we come to the main verse, this main du'a of Musa alayhi salam, Rabbi, inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer. Because we have to mention the prelude to this. How does Musa alayhi salam come to this state of making this du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can use today? Oh my Lord, I'm in a state of weakness, poverty. I'm in a bad state. Whatever you send up down upon me, I'm in need of it. So you have to read the prelude to understand the journey of this surah. The journey of Musa is up to why does he eventually come to make this supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because this isn't one of those occasions that Allah just mentions the verse. Allah mentions a whole prelude, a whole journey of Musa alayhi salam. Just like Yusuf alayhi salam mentions the whole journey when he comes to this dire state and his dire need. Taseemim. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin. By these haruf muqatta'at. Indeed, this is a clear book that we sent down. Natnu alayka min, min nabi Musa wa fir'auna bil haqq. We send down the story of Musa alayhi salam and, the, and the, his relationship with, with, with Fir'aun with truth. For people to believe, to revitalize their iman. That's what Ibn Kathir he mentioned. This verse is just like how Allah began Surah Yusuf. Allah began Surah Yusuf by mentioning, When That's Ibn Kathir understands this verse. That is a true story. Just like the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, pay attention to this story. What happened to Musa alayhi salam inside this journey? Inna Fir'aun ala fil ard. Fir'aun became arrogant. Ala fil ard. There's another place at the end of the Quran that he mentions about himself. When he speaks about himself, what does he say? Ana rabbukumul a'la. I'm your almighty Lord. Another place in the Quran he mentions, don't you see? I'm your mighty God, I'm your Lord, I'm your deity, you should worship me. Don't you see these rivers flowing underneath my palace? Then he says to his servants as well, says to the followers around him, do you know another deity besides me? Look at his arrogance. Look at his kalimat. Look at his words. How he professes himself, how he displays himself. And you can see the fara'ina. You can see in the museums, even Egypt at the moment, how they display their strength, their might, their power, their arrogance to show to the people. That's why they had this, this false batil belief that when we die, all our treasures that are buried with us will take us to the hereafter. That's why they built these supreme pyramids that remain today was classified as the seven wonders of the world. They're not wonders of the world, they're signs, ayat. Lil mutawassimin. To see that these people built these great big pyramids and believe that they could protect themselves from death and they believe that in the hereafter we're going to take our treasures, all this gold, these treasures we buried inside the depths of these pyramids. We're going to be resurrected with it inside Al-Akhirah. That's their belief. That was their conviction. Even today, that's what people, like, they think. They think they can buy life and death. They think that when we die, we're going to return back once again. Because the Quran mentions that on the day of judgment, that the believing individuals, they'll be standing there. They'll be reclining on their couches, on the couches. They'll be laughing at them because they used to laugh us inside this dunya. Every time they go past the believing individuals, they scoff at them. They look down upon them. They belittle them. Look at the kalimat of some of these people at the moment. It's not hidden. Look at their hatred. The Muslims are scums. We need to wipe out all the Palestinians. We need to wipe out the whole of Gaza. They don't deserve to live. They're creatures. They're spiders. They're ants. They're evil people. They're, uh, they're animals. They don't deserve a life. They need to be wiped out. These are open words they profess. That they're saying to the whole world. And then they're saying to the whole world, do whatever you want to do. Do whatever you want to do. This is what our vision is. This is what we want to do. Dare anyone come and stand in front of us. And what is the state of us? 
What is the state of our weakness? That we find? Just like in Musa alayhi salam, when they said to Musa after saying all these armies, all this journey, they said to Musa, Inna la mudrakun. We're going to be overpowered. There's Fir'aun behind us with all of his troops. Musa alayhi salam in his journey, what does he say to his people? What does he remind them? We're not living for 50, 60 years. We've been here for 1445 years. That's how long we Muslims have been here for. Even prior to that, but as, as Muslims of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. That's how long we've been here for. Where's that conviction? Where's that iman? What does Musa say to his people? Qala kalla. He said, no, we're not going to be overtaken. Inna ma'i rabbi sayahdeen. My Lord is with me. He's going to guide me. He's going to give us victory. Don't give up hope. That's what the Palestinian people have said, that the greatest thing you can give up on them, the greatest thing you can give up on them is hope. When you give up hope, we've lost. Whenever you have hope within you, you climb mountains. You achieve so many things inside your life because hope is a burning desire. Hope is a conviction that is not extinguished. The hope of Al-Iman. That's what we need to instill within ourselves. That's the journey of Musa alayhi salam. He continues throughout his life. Continues on every single avenue in his journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This individual Fir'aun, he split their groups of people. He divided fractions. Study history, study today. Fractions of the Palestinian people divided in fractions for what purpose? To make them fight amongst themselves. But look what Iman does. What does Iman do? You can spend all the money on the earth. مَا أَلَّفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ You cannot unite hearts of believers. You can't unite Muslims. You spend all the money. You can't buy a Muslim. You can't buy him to be a Muslim. You can't buy him to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites the hearts. This is a tactic existed right at the beginning. Of the journey of Fir'aun that we find. What does he want to do? He wants to slay their children. Slay the children. And kill the women. Put that in context in today's world. Kill the children and slay the women. This is Fir'aun. This is Fir'aunic traits. Characteristics of Fir'aun Kill the children Get the children out the way Because they fear Just like Fir'aun knew that When he saw that dream And he asked his advisors Who's going to destroy me? He saw it in a dream Someone's going to destroy me It's Musa alayhi salam That's why he get executed Ibn Kathir writes a whole story About these verses at Surah Al-Qasas He writes a whole story They wanted to get Musa They wanted to catch him but they said, you know what, if we start slaying all the children, we're going to have no slaves to tilt the land, to take care of the land. So the Wuzura said, you know what, leave them one year, then slay them the following year. So Harun was born in the year that boys were not to be slayed. His older brother, Musa alayhi salam. Then when Musa's turn came, Ibn Kathir mentioned that even his mother didn't have the signs of pregnancy upon her. But they had spies. They had intelligence. There are people going around looking at people's homes. Just like today, read the history of Palestine. They have names of people. They have names of people. Names of whom? Shall I share with names of whom? Names of children. Names of children. Of children we need to take. They come outside houses and they announce them on a megaphone. And people thinking, who are these names that they're asking for? They're names of the children. That they want to take out. A child who's five years old. is charged five years old. He's dragged. As if he's some form of vicious individual. Headlocked. Persecuted. For what purpose? It doesn't harm them. They retaliate with gas. They retaliate with rubber bullets. And then when it serves their interest. They retaliate with live bullets. They retaliate with live bullets. On the children. This is all the way of the Fir'aun understanding of life of the world. Which the Quran has depicted thousands of years ago. Giving a description of these individuals. Inna min al-mufsideen. That this individual is a corrupt individual. That's what you find. Stay away from 
such statements as ana li and indi that i have this or i own this or this belongs to me these are all paths of arrogance that's why firauni mentioned or before that shaitan mentioned ana khairu minhu shaitan believed he's better than adam alayhi salam just like today some humans feel they're better than other humans we're better than these people and like what you find li when firaun said alayhi li mulku misr don't you see our own the palace the kingdom of of misr belongs to me and indi we come to the story of qarun when he says that i've been given this wealth utitu ala ilmin indi i've been given this knowledge and this wealth because of my own skill that's why qarun is mentioned inside this surah like was haman and firaun just we mentioned to use linguistics this is a play this is a story the main players inside this story are firaun are qarun and haman these are the three leaders of disbelief that we find are mentioned inside this surah how they begin to carry out their atrocities that's why firaun said to haman build for me from clay build for me a ladder that i may attaliu ila ilahi musa i may climb this ladder and see the god of musa just as like these people say when they shoot and they kill us show us your god show us where your god is today all the way of firaun that we find so he's trying to mock musa alayhi salam and mock his people and like what you find qarun in qarun kana min qaumi musa fa bagha alayhim qarun was a, from the family of musa but he began to carry out these op- oppressions as we're going to later we're going to mention but continue this journey in the beginning allah mentioned awhayna ila musa ila ummi musa ardi'ihi we're turning back to the story of musa and his mother when they began to intelligence began to discover that this musa there's a baby there's a baby inside this house so ibn kathir mentions that she built a tabut a small basket what we call in today's language the, the moses basket and she placed musa inside that basket because their house was on the edge of the river nile and she'd release the basket to go out so when the soldiers and intelligence came in they couldn't find anybody except for harun and maybe some of the other siblings they would return and one day in their rush and their haste the soldiers came and she put musa inside the basket and she forgot to tie up the basket she forgot to tie the basket and musa is left as the soldiers enter and they look around and they run out again she returns to grab the rope but musa's gone Musa has drifted away. Look at the plan of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He drifts away all the way until where does he reach? He comes to the edge of the palace of Firaun. A lovable child as Ibn Kathir mentions such beauty and love was there. Whoever looked glanced upon Musa would fall in love with Musa alayhi salam. So when he comes to the edge of the palace of Firaun and some of the servant female servants maids of Asia are there. and they see this basket they grasp this basket they want to bring it back to to their leader to the woman in charge of them and when they open up this basket she sees this beautiful child and remember she's barrenless she doesn't have a child she immediately falls in love with Musa and wants to keep Musa remember this is the same Musa who's going to destroy Firaun returns back in the house of Firaun trying to escape Musa away But he's come deep down into the house and he's brought up inside the house of Firaun. That's what Allah mentioned for the khifti alay fa alqihi fi al-yam. And when you come fear for him to put him inside the basket, put him inside the river. And then Allah mentioned wala takhafi wala tahzani inna radu ilayki wa ja'iluhu min al-mursalin. That's what ulama tafsir mentioned this is a place inside the Quran. Two informations, two prohibitions, two glad tidings. all put together for this mother of of, of Musa alayhi salam we in radu ilayki we're going to bring Musa back to you mustahil how can Musa alayhi salam come back to his own mother how's that going to pan out how's that going to take place so ibn kathir continues the narration continues the story that Musa alayhi salam doesn't drink milk from the breast of any woman doesn't drink it So the, the sister of Musa is following and find out what's happened so they brought Musa to the marketplace that is there a woman who's ha- who has a child who can feed Musa because he's not drinking the milk so when the Musa's sister sees that 
she says to them, should I not guide you towards a family whereby there is a mother whereby he will drink the milk? So they bring Musa to his own mother and she feeds him. He goes back again, Asya sends many gifts and maids and servants and everything. She said, I don't want any of this. They want her to come to the palace and feed Musa every day. They want her to come, his mother, his biological, biological mother to come to the palace and feed him every single day. She says, no, I've got responsibilities. I've got other children. Bring Musa to me. Inna radu ilayki. We're going to bring him back to you. Ya Ummi Musa. So he would come daily back to his mother. He'll be fed. He'll be changed. He'd love and affection given to him. His biological mother. This is the plan of Allah. We don't seem to understand that plan. وَجَعِلُوا مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And we're going to make him to become amongst the prophets. وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ شُدَّ وَاسْتَوَى آتَيْنَوْ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ When we became strong and powerful, we gave him wisdom, foresightedness, insight. We made him a prophet. We gave him wisdom. This is Musa alayhi salam. وَدَخَلَ الْمِنْرِينَةَ أَلَا حِينَ غَفْلَةٍ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا He entered into the city. Ibn Kathir mentioned at the time of Qaylula after Allah that people were resting or later stayed, people were unaware. When he entered inside the city, what did he find? Two people fighting amongst themselves. So the person calls to Musa because Musa, as he's grown up, he's got the traits. Fir'aun knows who he is. Fir'aun is availing the opportunity, the opportunity to grasp, to get hold of Musa, but he can't because Asiya is protecting him. So this is a moment now that Fir'aun can catch him. Because when you find that this Qibti, the Coptic Egyptian is fighting, with, and Musa is trying to stop this fighting that's taking place. He was trying to stop the fighting. And Musa, what did he begin to do? He accidentally, he, he hit him. فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ He hit this individual. Whether he pushed him or he touched him. فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ This person, he died. He said, this is the... This is, a, this is the action of shaitan. You know, Musa, as you read, he see that was a powerful individual. Was a strong individual. Strong personality. Strong in his body structure. And even if you look at the, the hadith, inside the chapter that we find inside Sayyid Muslim. Yani man ahabbal adafan fil ardil muqaddasa wa nahwiha. Strange how ulama place certain hadith. Whoever wants to be buried inside the area of Baytul Maqdis or around this area, that's the chapter heading given by Sahih Muslim. And what, what hadith does he narrate place inside there? He places the hadith of Musa alayhi salam. When the angel of death comes to Musa alayhi salam to take his life. Musa alayhi salam doesn't recognize him, just sees it as just another individual and he smacks him. He shows the strength of Musa and we take it literally smacks him and the eye of the angel pops out the angel goes back to Allah and says that you told me to take this servant of yours he doesn't want to die he doesn't want to go die so go return back to him he comes back to Musa alayhi salam Musa alayhi salam says what is it what do you want from me he said that we want to take you deaf so he said that if I grasp the number of hair on this on an ox or on a bull Whatever here remaining, that's how much more life will I have? Will it be granted to me? He said, what will happen after that? He said, death. He said, if death is today or tomorrow, then you may as well take me now. That's why Imam Muslim plays a chapter to die in Baytul Maqdis because he's buried somewhere there. Musa is buried somewhere in that location. Ibrahim is buried somewhere in that location. Many prophets are buried inside that location because it is Ardul Muqaddasa. It's a blessed environment. That's when some Muslims will say, oh, why are we making Palestine the first cause of Muslims? Are not the Uyghur Muslims important? Are not the Kashmiri Muslims important? Are not the Iraqis, the Suris important? Yes, they're all important. They're all important. But this becomes more important because of why it's Ardul Muqaddasa. Because of the environment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks inside the Quran certain mawat in certain locations, certain places, certain times that become more rewarding. And more blessed because of certain locations, certain places that we find. Musa after killing this individual, they've sent out an entourage of soldiers, go and get Musa. But this is our excuse. He's carried out this action of killing one of our soldiers. So Fir'aun delegates, go out and find this Musa. Bring him now. Now we have an excuse to execute him. 
But an advisor, because remember, he has advisors around him. Musa as well does. Living in a house of Fir'aun, people grew to love and have affection towards him. So they came and said to Musa, you better scarper, you better leave. They're planning to kill you. So he left the city. He's scared and looking around. You know, showing the human nature that any minute, the army of Fir'aun are going to come upon me. Oh my Lord, give me success from these oppressive people. Then when he came to, headed towards the land of Madian, and perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may guide me inside his journey, inside my path. If we return back to Tasir ibn Kathir, inside Surah Al-Qasas that we find narrating the story what took place with Musa alayhi salam, he highlights that كان حافياً Musa alayhi salam was walking barefooted. Then they said that even till eventually the skin on the bottom of his foot began to drop off. Remember as we began with this is a precious individual of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but he has to go through this tedious task. This harsh job. Imam Suyuti, if I'm not mistaken, his tafsir, he begins to speak about that his lips become green, become dry, just eating a bare minimum of some plants, some seeds, seedlings. Some leaves that he eats on his long journey from Misr all the way to Madian is the state of Musa alayhi salam that, that we find. And as we find that when he enters into the city and he sees the flock of shepherds and he sees these two girls that we find that they are, that they are now standing outside the arena, outside the environment of these men. And he finds it very strange. And you look at this scenario, you know sometimes Muslim, when people say, oh, there's this going on, why are we speaking about whether a Muslim should wear a hijab properly? Why should we speak about whether a Muslim should pray properly? We should be worried about all these things. We should be worried about all these things in unison and try our best to encourage one another. Musa is in that diabolical state. What does he do? He sees these two girls. Why are you two girls here? Why are you here surrounded by all these men around you? What are you doing here? It's not befitting for you to be here. So they have to give the excuse. They have to say that the only reason why I'm here because our father is an elderly man. There's no other male individual inside the home. We have to come out and bring our buckets and pick up the water and take it back home. So Musa alayhi salam, that's what some of the ulama tafasid, they mentioned that some of these, these shepherds, what they did, that they used to place the rock, push the rock, over the well and just leave some remnants of water for other people. Remember Musa alayhi salam, hafian, tired, fatigued, downtrodden, weak, feeble. Musa alayhi salam comes to the rock and he pushes it. He moves it away for them and lets the girls come and to take their water. And then he goes underneath the tree, goes, lies down and tree, underneath the tree for saqa lahuma, thumma tawalla ila dhil. He turned, goes under the shade underneath the tree. فَقَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ And that's the dua. After all these verses, then he comes to that state. That he lies underneath the tree and he just sits there. And says, oh my Lord, whatever you send down upon me, I'm in a state of dire need. Some of the ulama tafasir mentioned, he just said, give, oh Allah, give me some morsels of bread, some crumbs of bread. Give me half a date. He's not even saying, Allah, give me a feast. I'm your prophet. I'm your messenger. I'm the one that you spoke to. Allah Musa taklima. Now I'm speaking to you, Ya Allah. Give me this. Rabbi inni, inni lima anzalta alayhi min khayrin faqir. Whatever you give me, I'm in dire need of it. And when he says that dua, he doesn't raise his voice. He doesn't say in a voice that we may say, Oh, you know what? I'm starving. I'm hungry. I'm in need. Help me. He just says it quietly underneath the tree. One of the girls hears the dua. One of the girls hears the dua. And that's why when she returns back to her father, and her father, amongst the majority of you, the father is Shu'ayb alayhi salam. One who Ibn Kathir, he rejects that. But ayyhal, let's accept it, is Shu'ayb alayhi salam. Or a righteous man, or from his lineage, or his family. But focus on the story. He says, why have you come back so early? Because normally you come back a certain time. Why have you come so early? And they narrate to their father, this we saw this individual who carried out his actions. So he says, bring this individual to me. So you find that, one of them returned back to him. Look at the lessons 
Ibn Uthaymin said, Tasir Surah Qasr mentioned Kamalul Adab, immaculate etiquettes. Ibn Kathir mentions, Faghatti ala wajhiha. She covered her face. She covered her face in coming in front of this strange man, Musa alayhi salam, who's a prophet of Allah. Walks in a state of bashfulness. Says to him that indeed my father, my father is calling you. That's what some of the ulama tafasir they mention. Look at the kalimat. Look at the adab. Not to give any element of excuse or thought, wrong concept. It's my father who's calling you to speak to you, to ask you what took place and what the story is. This is why you find that ulama speak about the man of adab that you find. Imam Sa'd inside his tafsir he mentions that Musa is I'm seeking no reward. فَتَوَلَّ إِلَى ظِلْ He went underneath the shajara inside the tree. Some ulama tafasir began to mention some ajaib, what type of tree, whatever it may be. It doesn't concern us. Just lies there, just sits there. That's why Allah mentioned, وَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Ask Allah from His bounty. That's what Musa a.s. is doing. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Allah says, call upon me and I'll respond to you. Imam Qurtu, he mentions طَلَبُ الطَّعَامِ He just requested some food from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find that these girls that they return back. And so when he narrates this story to their father, he said that you've done the best thing, what you've done. And one of them says that hire this individual. In the khayra man istajadta al-qawiyu al-ameen. The best person you can hire is a strong and a trustworthy individual. Ibn Kathir begins to mention, how do we know that Musa al-Islam is al-qawi al-ameen? How do you know he's strong? He's shown that he's strong. In a dire need, he moves a whole rock, a whole boulder from a, a well. He moves it. That shows the strength of Musa alayhi salam. Al-Qawi. How do we know he's al-Amin? He's trustworthy. We know he's trustworthy because the girls narrate. He never glanced at them. He never looked at them. That's we find so many different descriptions of the nature of Musa alayhi salam. As we mentioned many times, that he, wo he walked in front of them. They walked behind him. They threw stones to show him the direction. He's shown he's a trustworthy individual. He's a strong personality. He's a trustworthy man. That's why you find that their father gives him this option. That you can marry one of my daughters, stay here, live with us for either eight or ten years. Whichever one of them that you, you carry out, I will not complain about that. That's what your ujra, that's what you need to do. And he completed it and then he makes that return that back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the story begins to continue of meeting and speaking to Allah and returning to Fir'aun as we mentioned. Up to 50 verses or these 88 verses speaking about Fir'aun, speaking about Musa and then the return again after the 77th verse, 76th verse. It returns to this final character that we find is a character of Qarun. Inna Qarun kana min qawmi Musa fabagha alayhim. Qarun was from the family of Musa and he began to become oppressive towards him because of the wealth that he had. Read the end of Surah Al-Qasas when he speaks about the wealth he had, that the keys were held by Usba, by strong men. Usba in the Arabic language has the meaning of 10 men, 10 strong men are holding the keys. The keys, Imam Suyuti narrates inside as a tafsir of Durul Manthur that there were Sab'in Bighal, 70 donkeys, mules, that had the, 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 the treasures, the treasures that belonged to Qarun. So he began to boast upon himself. And he said to this individual, إِذْ قَالُوا قَوْمُ لَا تَحْفْرَحْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ لَا يُحِبُّ الْفَرِحِينَ Don't boast. Don't become an arrogant individual because he began to say to his people that this has been given because of my own skill. I'm an intelligent person. I had the ability to turn money over or create this treasure, have this treasure. So it's something Allah's given this to me. So I have the right to carry out these actions. Look for Allah mentioned, look what we've done to Qarun. How we destroyed Qarun. Him and his wealth and his home are sinking in the ground. And what do we do to Fir'aun? Look at read Surah Yunus. Read Surah Yunus, what happened to Fir'aun when he said, Al An, kunta min al mufsidin. Now you want to believe and use from amongst the mufsidin. That's a key ayat inside this surah. Inna Allah la yuhibbu al-mufsideen. Allah doesn't like corrupt individuals. Inna Allah la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimeen. Allah doesn't guide oppressive people. Inna Allah la yuflihu al-zalimoon. Allah doesn't give success to oppressive individuals. 
key ayat inside this surah. There should be lessons for us to fawaid. Likewise, Musa mentioned, When he killed the individual, he said, Never in my life am I going to aid criminals. I made this mistake, but I'm never going to stand again with criminals again inside my life. And likewise, inside this surah that you find, You can't guide whom you love. Musa is in the home of Fir'aun. A prophet in his house is still not guided. Allah mentions this inside this surah. You can't guide whom you love. It's not for you to guide people, but Allah is the one that guides. And likewise, another key ayah inside this surah. Show goodness to people like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shown goodness to you. So whatever blessings that we have, we should show goodness. That the time, the wealth, the property, the mind, the skill, ability that we have today. In the free world that we live in. We should use that to support the other causes, the other people around us to alleviate their sufferings and their hardship. And as the end of the surah, it mentions, كُلُّ شَيْءٍ هَالِكٌ إِلَّا وَجْهَ لَوْ الْحُكْمُ وَلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ The end of the surah concludes that what's the end going to be? Just like Musa alayhi salam, when he said to the angel of death, I'm going to die now or tomorrow, I may as well die today. And that's what the Palestinian people say as well. If we're going to die today or tomorrow, we may as well die today. Because we know we're going to die tomorrow. It makes no difference to us. We know what's going to happen to us. We're going to be bombarded. We're going to be bombed. We're going to be harmed. We know that. Death is always inside our eyes. Death is right in front of us. It's all there. That's why you even see the small children, you see them. They visualize death. They see it clearly. They speak, they speak like they're powerful men and women. They're speaking with a mind that we can't comprehend. That we're not going to give in. We're not going to move an inch of our land. We're not going to move an inch. This is our land. We know what you're going to do to us. The atrocities and the hardships you're going to place upon us. And you're going to bombard us, but we're going to remain vigilant. What should I give to us as we began with that hope and that aspiration, that strength, that as we in our comfortable lives, what are we doing about this cause? And if we don't do anything, as the end of the surah it mentions, everything will perish. Everything will die and all of us will return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.